This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. There are many outstanding questions today about Jesus Christ. Who is He really? What really was His mission? Why did He really come to this earth? What did He really accomplish? Unfortunately, most of Christendom has made Jesus Christ into something he's not. Many traditions have been developed around events, experiences, and ideas that have nothing to do with him, his life, or his ministry. Sadly, many true facts about him have been distorted and ignored. The real story behind this incarnate God being, who now sits at the right hand of the Father, alive, is so incredible and remarkable that it is stranger than fiction. Stay with us as we explore the biblical facts surrounding Jesus Christ on today's program. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Bill Watson. Well, again, welcome to another international telecast of the Armor of God. Good to be with all of you once again. Bill Watson here, hosting the program for the remaining duration of time that we have here together. You know, occasionally throughout my life, I've had people come up to me and ask me, you know, Bill, do you know Jesus? And perhaps, you know, you've even had a few folks in your life come up to you and ask you whether or not you know the Lord. And it always amazes me as to how some people will come up to you and claim that they know the Lord when, in fact, they don't know what he looked like, they don't know anything about his family, they have no idea about where he lived or even what his values are. And frankly, it, it just, as I say, kind of, well, I find it curious how somebody can say, well, I know the Lord, when, in fact, or I know anybody for that matter, when, in fact, fundamentally, you don't know the simplest things about them. Well, I want to spend a little bit of time today exploring some facts about Jesus. That's right, facts that oftentimes are not emphasized in uh, many of the ministries today, but yet nevertheless are in your Bible and do in fact clarify some things about Jesus Christ and of which I would hope you will find interesting and perhaps consequently allow you to feel a little bit more, well, aware of, a little bit more in tune with what Jesus was really like. But before I do that, let me interrupt myself as we often do here to provide with you our, our introduction to our free offers. And that is on today's program, we're gonna be offering free of charge. And I always like to emphasize that free of charge, a piece of literature titled Christ in the Old Testament. That's right, not in the New Testament, Christ in the Old Testament of all things. Uh, it's free, and along with that, we've got a one-hour presentation titled Facts About Jesus Christ. And these presentations here, these offers, are going to introduce to you, as I've already mentioned, some interesting factoids that perhaps you're unaware of, but nevertheless, as I said, are in your Bible, and hopefully by becoming acquainted with these things, you will find Jesus to be a more familiar personality to you. All you've got to do now is dial that 888 number, 578 Ask the operator, as I've already mentioned, and emphasize these two free offers. Ask them for them. They're available to you today, 888 And don't forget about that website. You can continue to watch Armor of God telecasts from the past at your convenience uh, whenever 
you would like. We've got a whole plethora of uh, volumes there that are uh, what you could say archived on the uh, website at www.cgi.org. So don't forget now, 888-578-8791 and that website at www.cgi.org. Now, let's get back to this program. I want to share with you, as I mentioned, some of these facts, facts that are not emphasized perhaps like they should, because if they were, I think people would have, well, what you could say, a more familiar and better comfort level about the personality of Jesus Christ. And certainly we are encouraged, Christians, of course, are always encouraged to have a good relationship with Jesus. And yet it stands to reason, does it not, that in order to enhance your relationship, well, you ought to find out as much as you can about the individual you'd like to get to know, right? Well, that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time doing today. And and for our first exploration in this, our first factoid that I want to emphasize to you, and I know some of you that are of the Catholic persuasion <laughs> are probably going to find this maybe a little bit surprising or maybe at least curious at best uh, as to what I'm about to cover because what I'm about to cover is to introduce to you the fact that, that's right now, ready? Jesus had brothers and sisters, multiple brothers and sisters. And it's in your Bible. Your Bible's clear about this fact that Jesus did indeed have half-brothers and half-sisters. As I've often said, same mother, that is his brothers and sisters, same mother, but a different father, of course. Jesus was exclusive, that of being the firstborn of the Father God that we understand as introduced to us by Jesus in his ministry. And Jesus, of course, playing that role of the firstborn uh, of him and, of course, a virgin birth at that. But your Bible's clear, and I want to bring your attention over here to Matthew chapter 13. Now, I've already turned there, but I want to bring to your attention over here in verse 53 of Matthew 13 and point something out to you. Jesus is over in his own area. He's back in his old neighborhood in Nazareth. You can read about that there in verse 54 where it says he came into his own country and he taught the people in the synagogue. So he went into the neighborhood synagogue, sat himself down, started teaching a little bit. And it says here that the people were astonished. They were kind of amazed, kind of taken back and responding correctly as neighbors would, maybe even some aunts and uncles uh, being in the audience, that is brothers and sisters to Joseph and Mary. Uh, they said here in response in verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Notice that? They're, they're a little surprised. They said, is not his mother Mary, called Mary, and his brethren, look at this, his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, plural, notice that, plural. Some commentators will tell you at least two. If not, in some cases, the Greek can certainly portend the fact that it could have been as many, minimally anyway, as three. He says here in verse 56, And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? Now, I know some of you may say, Now, wait a minute, Bill. Jesus called everybody his brother and his sister. Okay, I'll give you that. Let's, let's go uh, over here just a, a few pages back to Matthew chapter 12 here for a moment. Another situation, and that's a legitimate question. And that's what we're doing here. We're exploring God's Word together. And it's good to have healthy questions about this because, as a matter of fact, I had the same question when I was beginning to become first introduced to some of this new information, uh, for some of you anyway, it being new. But in Matthew chapter 12, now let me bring your attention over here to verse... 46, verse 46. Now here again, Jesus is uh, in a situation where he's teaching and he's going back and forth and so on. And he's in the middle of a discussion here, a teaching exercise. Verse 46, and he's interrupted. It says here, while he is yet talking to the people, okay, get that in your, in your mind, get the picture, behold, his mother and brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Then said one, in the audience apparently, somebody yelled out and told him, Behold, hey, your mom, your mom is here, your mother, and your brethren, you see that? Your brethren uh, stand without desiring to speak with you. They, they want to talk to you, Jesus. So they're interrupting Jesus in his presentation of all things. Now, as often, Jesus takes this opportunity 
to use it as a, well, a fulcrum, a, a, a prop, a, an educational tool to illustrate the very question we're debating in that how he often called everybody his brother and sisters. Well, look at this. Here it says, but he answered the individual who was interrupting him in the audience there, and he says this to him, verse 48 now of Matthew 12, who is my mother and who are my brethren? That's the question we're debating. And he says here, and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples. Ah. All right, so we've got a couple of categories going on here, you know? And he, he stretched forth his hand and he says, who are all my disciples, he says. And he goes on here, he says, um, behold, my mother and my brethren, being all inclusive. In other words, he didn't want the people to sense any distinction between biological half-blood relatives versus others of the human race because he understood that he was there on a mission as the Savior to all mankind. And though there was actual half-brothers and sisters in the audience of which this gentleman legitimately was interrupting Jesus to tell him about that, Jesus wanted everyone in the audience to understand, okay, but here, really, this is what's most important, that everybody understands that you're all my mothers and brothers, sisters and brethren and so on. Now I can tell you're still not convinced. All right. I'll, I'll give you that too. All right, well, let's, let's move on here. I'll, let's go to another scripture over here in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Because, I mean, this is, this is really, it's, I mean, it's all in your Bible. You can find these stories. They're very interesting stories and certainly uh, quite colorful in many respects when you begin to understand that Jesus was a real guy living for 33 and a half years on this planet, three of a half of those years being devoted to his ministry. But he had almost 30 years of growing up as a kid, as a teenager, and a young adult. Grew up in a neighborhood in Nazareth, was the son of a carpenter, and became a carpenter. And in those days, more than just a carpenter, he was probably a mason, a stone worker, and so on, and was most, uh, most likely well-built and, and pretty well-stocked in terms of his physique was concerned because it was hard work. But nevertheless, here in John 2, still talking about this mother, brother, and sister uh, topic and, and issue, let's go to verse 12 here of John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and in verse 12, we read, look at this, after this, he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum. This was another city. They were on the move. He, look at this, his mother, his brethren, and his disciples. So he's traveling. He's going to Capernaum, a holy day. He was trying to get over to the city for uh, Passover, as you read the context here. But he's with his mother. He's with his brethren. And he's with his disciples. Obviously, there's a distinction here made by virtue of the Greek word used, brethren versus disciples, illustrating the fact that disciples and brethren are two distinct groups, along with a third group, uh, not necessarily a group, but the individual, being his mom. So here again, and once more, we see a clarity made, a distinction made, for the purpose of clarifying in our minds, at least anyway, that we should begin to understand that there were indeed half-brothers and sisters of Jesus, of which Mary apparently had additional children, of course, after Jesus' virgin birth. But let's move on here. Uh, let me take you down here to uh, Galatians, over here in the New Testament, book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is describing a little bit about his genesis, his conversion, and what he experienced on his road to Damascus. Remember when he was stricken with blindness and, and essentially resulted in his conversion, that whole experience? Well, we read over here in Galatians chapter 1, verse about 15, as Paul begins to uh, break into the uh, context and, and moves on with the story. He says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But, 
I went into Arabia, returned again to Damascus. So he's explaining a little bit about what went on and how, how it all kind of transpired and unfolded. Verse 18 now, Galatians chapter 1, notice this. Then after three years, okay, after three years, he finally goes to Jerusalem. He sees Peter and apparently abodes with him 15 days. But look at this. No other apostles, verse 19, Galatians 1, did he see except, notice, James, the Lord's brother. Did you notice that? Paul identifies James, and even today, uh, certainly many of you are well aware of the fact that many well-known scholars will recognize that the book of James was indeed written by Jesus' half-brother. And in the book of Acts, James, especially in uh, chapter 15, where there was a meeting that transpired there in discussing some doctrinal differences and issues that uh, was developing among the congregations and in the, new early uh, the early New Testament church there and how they were trying to debate these issues, you will find that James, Jesus' half-brother, essentially chaired that meeting and was basically the one who established the summary of what the action plan was going to be as a result of those particular discussions. One other thing here I just want to show you before we go on to something. Uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to go on to another other subject here in a moment, but I just wanted to point this out as well. This is after the resurrection, the Apostle Paul talking in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he's explaining how there were like 500 people. Look at this, verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul states, after that he was risen, uh, or was seen, I'm sorry, seen of about 500 brethren at once, talking about Jesus. In other words, Paul is confirming the fact Christ was literally eyewitnessed by over 500 people that he was alive after death. They watched him become crucified, beat, and so forth. But here Paul is uh, witnessing to the fact and testifying to the fact over 500 people saw Jesus alive after he was killed, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some have died. They've fallen asleep. It's a polite way of saying died. Verse 7, though, notice this now. Here's what I wanted to point out. After that, he, Jesus, was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Why that distinction? Why that pointed comment about James? Well, if you read in John chapter 7, you'll get the story that even some of Jesus' own family were rather sarcastic and cynical about his own ministry and who he claimed he was. And I'm sure James, growing up with his brother, half-brother Jesus, throughout those years that they lived together, I don't know how much older Jesus was than James, but the point being in this particular case, I'm sure James had a difficult time because of the element of familiarity of believing Jesus and who he really claimed he was. But here your Bible specifically states, and for a reason, to illustrate that even his own brother came full circle and accepted Jesus as his personal Savior and even supported the ministry of his bro older brother by himself becoming a strong personality in that early New Testament church. Now, let's move on to another subject here. One that uh, I think in many cases, many of you are, well, what you could say, kind of fixated on because we've been hammered with it, frankly, for quite a long time. And what I'm talking about is the very traditional view of the Jesus of the West, you know, the long-haired guy with the kind of effeminate look, kind of soft and weakly, uh, kind of uh, what you could say, um, oh, tender. Uh, they, they, they've been, that is, these pictures all over the place. I mean, we've even seen them portrayed in Hollywood movies one after another, over and over, traditionally advancing the uh, concept of this long-haired, effeminate, kind of weakling-looking character who is portrayed, by the way, as a standout. You know, he, he could be uh, basically identified in a group of people in a New York minute, as they would say, because, well, of course, he'd be wearing a long white robe with a little halo following him around wherever he went. There would be this little halo above his head, you know, and you could be standing a thousand feet away and you'd just see him glowing from the other people he would be surrounded by because he would be so easily identified because of the fact that he was indeed the Son of God. But my friends, this is wrong. This is not the right image that 
that we should have. This is a false image and has nothing to do really with the way Jesus Christ really looked. Now, I want to bring your attention back to this point and illustrate something very clearly here. The prophet Isaiah has something to say over here in a prophecy about 700 years before Jesus' physical birth in chapter 53. And we read here something very interesting, and I want to bring your attention to it immediately because there are some comments I want to bring to your attention from some commentaries to illustrate something. It says here in verse 1, Chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah, many of you are aware of this chapter being the prophetic description of the Messiah to come. This was written, as I said, about 700 years before Jesus came on the scene in Jerusalem. And it, we read here, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Here's what I wanted to emphasize. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, and many commentaries will explain to you, and I want to read one of those commentaries from uh, Clark here in uh, this section under Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to put it up on the screen there. Read along with me in this particular translation because this is what it says in the Greek language. Uh, this is a, a different translation, but it adds clarity uh, as a result from this commentary from Clark. He says, regarding he has no form nor comeliness, it would be also in the original Hebrew, better stated, he has no form nor any beauty that we should regard him, nor is his countenance such that we should desire him. In other words, Jesus, ladies, sorry, was not a really good looking guy. He wasn't, you know, the tall, dark and handsome type. Frankly, he was a rather common-looking fella. Your Bible is clear about certain incidences throughout Jesus' ministry of which illustrate the fact of how he was able to indeed in, uh, escape out of the arms of particular individuals uh, that he himself was confronted with due to comments that he made. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll put it up on the screen. Well, let's turn there real quick. We'll, we'll share with you at least one story anyway over here in John chapter 8 to illustrate my point of what I'm talking about. Because if, frankly, he was in a white robe with a halo over his head and had long, you know, flowing hair and had these, you know, particular eyes that were mesmerizing and so forth, what is about to be described, I'm sure, would hardly have occurred. Case in point, notice this, he's in an argument, Jesus is, with the Pharisees. He just got done telling the Pharisees that he was alive before Abraham, of all things. Now that was a blasphemous statement as far as the Pharisees, the scribes, were concerned. And they were not amused at Jesus' what they perceived to be arrogance in saying such a thing that he, of all things, was alive before Abraham. Nevertheless, Jesus states it, holds his ground, and says in verse 58 of John chapter 8, over here, notice this, he says, Jesus says unto them, Truly I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now they knew what that meant because that was the being who identified himself to Moses. When Moses asked the question, well, who should I say sent me? Well, the voice came back to Moses saying, I am. Tell him I am sent you. Well, Jesus now is connecting himself with stating essentially he was the I am of the Old Testament who introduced himself to Moses of all things. Well, look what they did. They took up stones to cast at him. But notice, Jesus himself went out of the temple going through the midst of them and got away. Why? Because he wasn't six foot six. He wasn't outstanding in his appearance. He was a commoner. He looked very common and consequently was able to escape out of the clutches of crowds that virtually were trying to do violence to him. You can read about another story in John chapter 10, verse about 34 to 42, as well as, and we'll put this up on the screen too, Luke 4, 21 through 30. 
But now, more specifically, because time's running out on me, and I knew this was going to happen because there's so many things I could share with you, friends, but I wanted to illustrate this one major point over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we go through some spiritual symbolism that Paul uses to illustrate certain distinctions between the male and the female gender. And part of the distinctions is dealing with the length of hair, of all things. That's right. Notice right here in this particular section of Scripture, we read, does not even nature, this is verse 14 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. Did you see that? It says here, but if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given to her as a natural veil, a covering of which spiritually illustrates certain things you'd have to read about previous uh, to this whole uh, discussion here as it concludes on this segment. But then Paul says, if any man seems contentious, we have no uh, dispute with this custom, uh, neither do the churches of God. But the point that Paul's trying to make is, well, we're not going to throw people out of the church because they have long hair, but let it be known a man who has long hair is in a shameful role. And yet here we portray Jesus with hair the length, in some cases, even longer than some women who wear their hair in that particular case. My friends, there is so much more that I could share with you. Even, even in regards to the law, so many people think that Jesus nailed the law to the cross. And yet in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, what does he say? He says, think not that I've come to destroy the law, but rather to fulfill. On another note, many people don't realize the fact, going back there to John chapter 8, that Jesus was indeed alive before Abraham was. He was the I am, you see. And that how Jesus taught and was almost stoned for it there in John chapter 10. And you can read about it there. And I'll, I'll just remind you about that story of John 10 where he was in very heated discussions, quoting the book of Psalms in debating this uh, disagreement between the Pharisees and himself about the fact of him saying that you were born to become gods. How about that one? Read it there in John chapter 10. Friends, Dial now, 888-578-8791, and get the two pieces uh, that we're offering here today as offers on this telecast. A one-hour presentation titled, Facts About Jesus Christ. This is a CD offer to all of you, free of charge. All you've got to do is dial that 888 number that you see there on your screen, and ask also for the booklet titled, Christ in the Old Testament. You can easily read it in one sitting. 888 And don't forget about that website there as you see it displayed on your screen at www.cgi.org. Friends, this is Bill Watson, and as we often do, let me remind you once again, you keep on that armor of God so that you may be able to stand in this evil day. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by the Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at Post Office Box 2525, Tyler, Texas 75710. Call toll free at 1 888 578 8791 or call 1903 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at cgi.org or email us at armorofgod at cgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. This program is sponsored by the Church of God International and supported by our viewers.